Welcome back to Golden Rule Radio, your weekly podcast discussing the precious metal market and things that move that market. So we're going to start this week's show with a quote by Bill King from The King Report, because sometimes you just can't say it better than Bill does. Um, He says, behold the power and the glory of expiry manipulation. Uh, He goes on to say, once again, it occurs regularly. The mainstream media and numerous experts, quote unquote, scrounged for a fundamental rationalization for the recurring expiration rally that occurred on Tuesday in the stock market. Continuing the quote, he says, there is no need to overanalyze or overthink the robust rally. It was purely expiry manipulation, plus the desire to force the S&P 500 index above its 200-day moving average in order to convince traders and investors that the nine-and-a-half-year rally is still healthy. Healthy, healthy. Doesn't look too healthy to me. It's looking a little sick, but Miles, what do you have to add to that? Well, I just think it's fair that we explain what expired um, <laughs> yeah, just yeah. for expiry, for people expiration. That don't understand what yeah, uh, Robert, expiry? What means. is expiry and expiration? Let's do a quick one hundred and one. Well, generally speaking, you have options, and those options have an expiration date, sometime in the middle of the month, depending on what market it is. And so, people who own those options, or people who have taken the other side of the bet, institutions with big money on the line at that expiration date, at a certain number in the market. They want to push or pull the market a a certain way to a certain number or away from a certain number so that when those options get to that expiration date, they either expire worthless, so someone makes money, or they end up with a lot more value than they currently did if they didn't hit the number. So it's a push and a pull of big money trying to push a market or pull a market to a certain number or away from a number, generally speaking. For a win. They're trying to avoid a loss and they're trying to get their position that they took to pay out. Totally. Okay. Yep. So this, or for a gain, huge and, gain. So this would be one of the reasons why people look at the COT report every week and see where the futures and options outstanding contracts are. They compare that to the expiration dates coming up. And then like Robert said, use some of those uh, other markets to push the price the way they need it to go. Well, and, and Robert, I'm going to add to the King quote here a little bit too, because I love this part. If traders and manipulators expend too much energy manipulating stocks higher early in the week, the odds increase for a decline later in the week. And by the way, equity declines late in expiration week, particularly in October, have a history of becoming quite breathtaking. So, you know, he's clearly got the setup for an October decline if they get too aggressive in expiration week with manipulations early on in the week. Sure, and I'll add, because I went back and looked at kind of the topping pattern that happened in the U.S. equities market in 2007 relative to what we're seeing today. And in 2007, as the S&P 500 was forming the top, you know, obviously you didn't know that it was the top as it was going on. So it was kind of like today. We don't know if this is the top or not, but relative to what was happening there as the top actually was forming, it declined 13% before it rallied to make a slightly higher high later in 2007, and that higher high became the all-time high. Then the equities market completely rolled over, as we all know, in 2008. Well, at the beginning of this year, the S&P 500 declined 13%. Then it rallied just here recently to make a slightly higher high about Mm -hmm. one month ago. And now this latest decline, big decline that happened, you know, the last two weeks, um, it could be signaling something specific, something significant. Um, Since Tuesday's rally this week, Tuesday's rally, big rally that we're talking about with this expiry manipulation is not organic. You know, it's just an expiration manipulation. Then don't get too excited about the equities market because it's looking very similar to the top that formed in 2007. Of course, we don't know if this is the top now because time will tell. We'll have to see more data. More time has to pass. But very similar, the 13% decline rally to the new high high. That became the high, the all-time high. So could be the same, could not be, but just something interesting to note. Well, and I think this is a discussion of volatility too. I mean, we have to look at not just where the price is going right now in the Dow, but how it's getting there. Uh, There's no volatility when the market is in a continuation, right? You know it's going the same direction. You know where it's going. Very few people, except for maybe playing the options game to try to squeeze out a little bit of extra profit month in, month out. 
But realistically, the buy and hold guy knows where it's going, so it's fine. You get to these levels here where, you know, I was talking with a client of mine who's a baseball junkie the other day, and um, it's, it's almost like somebody leading off first base. Like you're trying to get that last couple inches, but you're always ready to dive back to the bag. And you're seeing the equities market do the same thing. I mean, we're inching forward, we're inching forward, we put in a high 1500 point drop. And then we're inching forward, we're inching forward, we put in a higher high, like Robert said, 2000 point drop. So it's almost like the market is ready to pull the trigger, ready to dive back to the bag, ready to even maybe switch positions. But we're seeing how much more can we, uh, can we squeeze out of the orange. That's a great October analogy. Very fitting. So we're a precious metals podcast and show. And so why do we say all this? Why are we talking about the equities? Look at what happened last week. If you hedge your portfolio appropriately, you're going to profit in some sectors while others are declining, right? That's that's something that the precious metals do for you. So we have to pay attention in in many aspects to, to many markets. So take us into gold here, Miles. Like what, what's going on in the last seven days? Sure, because our ultimate goal here is just accumulation, right? We want to accumulate ounces. We want to accumulate dollars. We want to accumulate shares. And you do that by buying things when they're undervalued. So if we look at gold over the last couple of days, we were in our 3% range for what, three weeks, four weeks? I mean, quite a while. Uh, we did have a breakout. Now, granted, that was on the news of the equity market drop. So we'll have to see if that's sustainable uh, as we the equity market potentially tries to push higher. Uh, maybe even, like Robert said, put in a new higher high, but we'll just have to see how gold responds to that. Although the equities going up doesn't necessarily mean gold has to go down. That's right. No, I mean, the dollar's up today and gold's up today. Not everything is perfectly predictable in, in terms of counter moves, right? And, sure. And there tends to be an inverse relationship between gold and the equities. Over time. Which we've seen, and that's over time, but it doesn't mean that it happens on a daily basis. Right. So I'll have a chart here where I've got a couple, what I would call most likely resistance levels. Uh, we're coming into that 2017 low now uh, in the mid 1220s. Uh, we've got divergence on the chart, I think a $10, $15 sell off here, and holding above that previous 3% range we've talked about is very, very bullish for gold. That's gold. What about silver? White metals. So silver, on the other hand, I actually think based on what the charts are doing is is still potentially stepping down. Uh, you know, we haven't had anything break out to the upside, but same thing. You know, we've got a potential three drives pattern with divergence looking at some previous low numbers from years past. So uh, silver, I think, is around the corner to make a turn up. Uh, but for the time being, I actually think silver could be inching back down until we see a breakout one way or the other. So turning over to platinum and palladium. Uh, We've pushed above resistance on platinum and then come back down to it. So the same thing I expect to see gold do, where we've, we're above that resistance level. I'm waiting to see where it turns back down to test it. Platinum has already done that. So it seems like platinum is kind of leading gold and it's sitting right above that resistance level right now. So we'll see if it pushes back down into the range. And you can see this on the chart here, or if we'll turn up. Uh, and then palladium, again, continues to do whatever the heck it wants. Uh, but it is stair-stepping <laughs> up with pretty massive divergence against RSI. It's going right into the right shoulder of that head and shoulders pattern it built back in January. If I was a short-term speculator on palladium, I would, and getting back to our conversation about futures, futures and options, I'd be looking at putting some sell orders in around 1100 the last thing we will mention is the FOMC minutes today are going to be released in about an hour. We're recording on Wednesday, so our listeners should note that the reaction of the markets due to the FOMC minutes being released, we will not have seen that before the show gets published tomorrow. So um, maybe going out on a limb and speculating a little bit on what the Fed's tone could mean to the markets. Um, if the Fed, this is my opinion, if the Fed has a confident tone that boosts the bond yields, that could spell more pain for stocks. If the Fed has a more cautious sounding narrative, that could help US indices to recover. So we'll see, you guys will already know by the time you listen to this. So just throwing it out, that out there. I love how we've reached a point in the world where caution <laughs> yeah. means free money. <laughs> and, and like it should shouldn't it be the other way around like yeah. adding adding gasoline to the fire you is actually Keynesian, more inflation right? yeah. but caution <laughs> nowadays just means more money well trump should doesn't be. have any intentions of slowing down he wants there to be more money more spending and he's he comes out and says look the fed is his biggest threat 
and he's accusing them of having too much independence. So you're right, adding fuel to the fire. We've got a lot of spending. We've got a ton of debt, right? So whatever the FOMC meeting, I, I honestly don't think that much will come out of it. There's not a meeting in November, but there is the big one in December where they've raised rates now. We're on a, an annual trend with a December rate hike, and I think that's kind of what we'll see. But it's interesting that you have the president coming out against the Fed. We haven't seen that in many administrations. Well, is he also signaling maybe what he wants to do, which is take over the Fed and take over the money <laughs> supply? Because he's saying they're too independent. They're this government, quasi-government agency. They're way too independent. We need to take control of them, right? Yeah. Hmm. Quasi is the key. They're not, right. they're not a government entity at all. They're just, right. you know, they have all the power. And I can see his frustration. But at the same time, it's like, look, you know, you, you do want, the benefits that come with a weaker currency. And the more they raise rates, the stronger the dollar can potentially become over the long term. That restricts his exporting, right? The importing from other countries. It makes our products less competitive. And certainly that impacts his employment agenda. But most importantly, he's blaming the Fed for the recent market downturns. He's saying that it's going to slow housing down and it's it's causing a lot of caution in the markets (laughs) that he doesn't think should be there. So Austrian austerity aggressive, (laughs) in case you want to remember this, Ah. and Keynesian is cautious, apparently. (laughs) So that's how I'm going to remember it from right now. I mean, obviously, logic says the exact opposite, but that's not the world we live in nowadays. So I'm going to lob one last thing in so we can touch the uh, international a little bit here. I'll just say that we also do have an EU summit uh, this week and discussing Brexit again, so keep an eye on that because that could have some euro implications, which would also have some dollar implications. And finally, because you mentioned it a minute ago with potential tariffs and discussion about trade, and Tori, I'm pretty sure you want to talk about this. Uh, What's going on with Saudi Arabia right now? Well, Saudi Arabia gives us a lot of geopolitical potential tensions because of the fact that with this missing journalist, okay, that everybody's probably heard this, this story, And the pressure now is on from the left and the right on Trump to invoke some sanctions against Saudi Arabia. Well, they're our number one Mideast ally, right? They're the reason that we have such a strong presence. They're our ally against Iran and and a lot of the other uh, Middle East countries that that otherwise uh, would love to see a a disappearance of U.S. presence from the region, okay? So Jamal Khashoggi, if I'm saying his name right, is missing. Well, we've got hundreds of billions of dollars you know some say actually 50 billion some say 100 billion on a on an arms trade deal that trump wants to see kind of go through and does this jeopardize that they have threatened the u.s currency as countermeasures if we do come out with sanctions they've said well okay well, we'll start dealing in oil outside the u.s dollar okay well that's that's a huge ripple effect with the petrodollar and you're already seeing dollar weakness on the world stage we've talked about it on this show repeatedly But Russia now, did you guys know that as of the end of August, Russia no longer holds any U.S. treasuries? That, to me, was unimaginable five years ago, right? So is it an indication of the world scene? And if we lose Saudi Arabia from all this and and you create sort of a, a trade war with them, that really can have global ripple effects for the U.S. dollar. But I thought Putin and Trump were like best friends. Yeah. I mean, shouldn't they be... Shouldn't they still be holding some U.S. Watch dollars? Watch what they just, do. Just Not from a friendship say. standpoint. <laughs> There's no collusion. I mean, if a buddy of mine needs to drop a box of stuff off at my house because he's run out of room in his storage cabinet, I think I'd happily find room for it. They can't even keep a few of our treasuries? That doesn't sound like a very uh, close no. friend. No, it doesn't. Watch, you know, don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. And, and that same thing goes for what goes on with the EU summit this week. Italy is wanting to increase their budget deficit, and the EU is saying they are not allowed to. And Italy is saying, we're going to anyway. So now you've got a standstill in the EU, <laughs> and it's going to be a very fascinating week to see how that whole thing plays out. So that's going to about do it for Golden Rule Radio this week. Thank you all for tuning in as usual. If you like what you heard, click that subscribe button, ring the bell to get notifications. Head on over to Facebook, McIlvaney Financial, or Twitter, at ICA Gold. And as always, you're welcome to give any of us a call here at our offices at one 800 525 9556. Thanks for listening. Have a good week.